So, we're gonna move into topic one, Thermocamp. Now, um, just before we start, there's always a question and it's always in there somewhere. Um, they always say, oh like, how should I use today? How should I study today? Should I take lots of notes? What should I do? I think the best util utilization for today is if you haven't seen this stuff before. So some of the fuel stuff I'm sure you will have because you will have done a bit of head start, everyone does. Um, but if you have only been through a few things, you're gonna to start to see some stuff that you, you haven't been over before. I think the best utilization for today is to sort of sit back, maybe have a notepad there, and just jot down big broad points. I don't want you to go through like example for this slide and write down all these dot points. Why? One, because you're gonna get these slides. There's no point writing this all down. Two, because you're not gonna go back to these notes. You're gonna go back to notes that are big broad sort of concepts saying, I need to revise this. I need to look into this. I need to go through um, different types of fuels. That's gonna get you to come back to it because you're gonna come back and go, all right, I now need to go and do that. So then you're gonna go ahead and do that. So for today, what I say is sort of sit back, just sort of take it in and just jot down some points that you think are important or some points that you wanna come back to. Sort of like little, little tick boxes to say, hey, I wanna come back and look at that. That's sort of the best way to go about the content you'll see today. So we're gonna start off with fuels. Essentially fuels can be broken down into two things, fuel choices and obtaining energy from fuel. So what is a fuel? A fuel is a substance that can be reacted with other substances, e.g. oxygen, leading to the release of energy that can be harnessed for a specific purpose. What's really important about this is that this is an explicit definition that you need to know. What's gonna be really annoying about this first part of fuels? It's a lot of rote learning. What I mean by rote learning, for those who don't know what that's what it means, it means you just need to memorize things. Um, it starts to feel like um, I always pick on the other science subjects um, and I would say that it starts to feel a lot like psychology um, because it's just memorizing. There's the first part of fuels, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of maths and there's not a lot of sort of explicit thinking or trying to problem solve. It's really just, what can I remember? Put it back down on the page. So the wording for the definition here is important because fuels, you, do, you don't wanna say fuels can be combusted. You need to say that fuels can be reacted with other substances. Um, so just a really important wording there. Um, as I said, explicitly stated in the study design. Um, and then what is renewable versus non-renewable? Another set of definitions, which isn't explicitly asked for, but has been asked before in an exam. Um, so what is renewable? Renewable is a resource that can be replenished by natural pro processes in a relatively short period of time. Another way of wording this in a way, wording that I tended to use was, um, it's a natural process which can renew the fuel quicker than we utilize the fuel. Or it's quicker in producing than what we use it. So think about if you're doing something and you're utilizing something, but it's being produced quicker than you can utilize it, thus you're always gonna get more. Whereas non-renewable is the opposite. As you use it, it cannot be replenished in that period of time. So fossil fuels, for example, they take thousands of years to form. We can use lots of fossil fuels in a day, but we can't produce lots of fossil fuels in a day. It takes thousands, thousands of years to, to form. So that's the sort of idea behind renewable and non-renewable. And then we have fossil fuels versus biofuels. So essentially this is how you sort of break down your non-renewable. So fossil fuels derived from living matter, underground for millions of years, biofuels derived from plant matter and can be produced at the same rate we consume it. So what are the ones you need to know? These are the ones that you need to know. So you need to know coal, coal seam gas, crude oil, LPG. Crude oil is the main one you need to know. You'll know that as sort of crude oil, petroleum, uh, petrodiesel, petrodiesel falls under crude oil. Uh, biogas, bioethanol, biodiesel. They're the three mains you, want to, you need to know for biofuels. Really important. This is the one you need to know the most about. So this is the one you need to know the most about. This is the one you need to need to know the most about. They always will ask you to compare biodiesel with petrodiesel. They're the two they always ask you to compare. That's just what happens. Um, and these are the things they like to ask you to compare, energy content, renewability, environmental impacts. We'll go through them. So we're just gonna go through each of these quickly. Now, what's really important about these slides is, I've sort of been creating these slides over the last four years, so there's way too much information in them, et cetera, and all that sort of stuff. So essentially what I'm trying to say to you is that I will highlight what is most important here. So, key point, it's reduced by anaerobic bacteria 
that decomposes organic waste. So essentially what happens is you put organic waste, um, whatever that is, into this sort of big dome. As you can see there, it's just like a big sort of composter in a sense. Um, and essentially there's lots of bacteria in there. Bacteria deal with it and they produce biogas. They produce a, a methane type gas. Now what's really important about this is that it's mostly methane, but it's not pure methane. This is the fuel component. This is the non-fuel component. Don't worry about these values. I'm just trying to explain that essentially there's a lot of methane, but there's not 100% methane. Um, and then there's also trace amounts of other products. This was asked for once about seven, eight years ago, and it has been asked for again. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, and because it contains less methane than fossil fuel gases, so coal seam gas has 96%, um, methane, it releases less energy because that's where the energy comes from. So being less percentage, it's going to be less energy released. And then this is the combustion equation. here. By ethanol, so this is produced from the fermentation of glucose by yeast. Um, so essentially glucose gets fermented and it produces ethanol and CO2. Um, and you'll see it a lot in those sort of E10 fuels. So, you know, if you drive past, I think, I think it's United. United always tend to have it. Um, they always have E10 at the top and you always think, oh, their petrol is really cheap, but it's not because it's their E10 that they're advertising as their main petrol. Um, and E10 is always cheaper because um, bioethanol is pretty easy to produce. It just doesn't have a lot of energy. So E10 fuel is not as strong or as sort of fuel efficient as normal fuel. That's why it's a little bit cheaper because you need more. You need to fill up more often because you don't get as much out of it. Um, and then biodiesel, this is the most important one. It's produced by using plant oils or animal fats in a transesterification reaction. Um, so you get triglyceride plus methanol, goes to, goes to glycerol plus biodiesel. And essentially this is a really ugly and big reaction right here. Don't worry about this right now. You will learn this when you get more into food chem. It's the one important part of food chem that you'll learn so don't worry too much about this right now, um, but it's nice to sort of just visualize what's going on. But this is most important when we get to food. So what's really, what's really important to note at the biodiesel is the name. Um, so we call it a fatty acid met methyl ester or a fame, but you're always going to call it a fatty acid methyl ester. Um, and it's one of the most confusing parts of the course because it mixes knowledge from multiple area studies, as you can see there. <clears throat> so don't stress too much. We're going to go through this in organic chem and then mainly through food chem. So it's mainly going to be uniform. So some disadvantages and advantages. Now, why I've got these slides in here is because I think it's a really good way to revise this content. So this content is really difficult to revise. That is the reality of it. Um, because it's rote learning, it's memorization. It's things like flashcards, writing things down. It's the only way to learn. And like, Flashcards are pretty useless these days. Like, to be honest, the way VCAR exams are being written and the way that they're being produced, um, flashcards are not really that useful. Why, is, why do I say that? It's because VCAR is writing exams in the, in the way that if you memorize something, you're going to get one of the four marks. They want you to be able to sort of problem solve and work your way through an example. Chem exams are really, really like that. However, this topic here, less so. So this topic here is one of those ones where you just kind of have to memorize. Um, and so doing these tables like this, so doing a table where you say, all right, what is the advantage and disadvantage of a fossil fuel versus a biofuel? And you make a table, you say, all right, my advantages are high energy content, easy to release energy, relatively easy to obtain, extensive existing infrastructure. So one of the other things about that is common sense things. Think of this as a common sense example. This isn't something that's going to be explicitly taught to you, but it's common sense. We've been using fossil fuels for the last hundred years. So there's lots of oh, like remaining infrastructure. We have coal mines everywhere. Like those things have been built for many, many years. We've sort of refined that science there to a point where we're very good at obtaining fossil fuels. Yes, it's not good for the environment, but it's something we've been doing forever. So we already have it there. Whereas if you think about biofuel, probably the last 20 years or the last 15 years as we've really started to push 
the environmentally friendly fuels. And we've really tried to start dephasing or phasing out our sort of coal mines and our crude oil and all of that stuff. And there's pushback everywhere, but eventually it will happen. But one of the things that slows that down is that we don't have the infrastructure in place. We don't have the things built to produce biofuels. So as you can see there, it's a massive advantage for fossil fuels. Disadvantages, non-renewable, emits large amounts of CO2, so it's a really bad greenhouse gas, and lots of other things there. So again, more common sense things, extremely damaging to the environment. Um, so as you can see there, it doesn't really look all that great. Uh, biofuels, advantages, renewable, relatively carbon neutral. Now we'll talk about this in a second, so don't worry about that terminology. Burns more cleanly, easy to source materials, etc. Disadvantages, lower energy content, so thus you're gonna need more biofuel to get the same amount of energy out. Um, can be complicated and costly to produce, um, can require large amounts of water to grow crops, fertile land, etc. So what does it mean by carbon neutral? So what we say by carbon neutral is that when a plant is growing, it absorbs carbon or car via carbon dioxide. So it, it absorbs that. And then essentially what happens is when we take that plant and we produce the biofuel, we produce a little bit of CO2. So we sort of say that it's offset. The CO2 that was absorbed by that plant, some of it is being re-released, but that's okay because that plant already absorbed it. So we think of that as a sort of offsetting. We then transport the biofuel. Again, releases a little bit of CO2. Again, we like to think of that as offsetting. So if this was 100%, we like to say this might have been like 30%, this might have been like another 30%. And then we say the biofuel is used. And then we say the rest of the CO2 is reproduced. So we say maybe like 40%. Might be a little bit more, might be a little bit less. As long as it's around that 100% coming in and 100% going out, as long as it's around that, it could be 95 going out, could be 105 going out. doesn't really matter if it's a little bit more, a little bit less. But as long as it's very close to each other, we call that carbon neutral. So what we say is that it's the carbon absorbed or the carbon dioxide absorbed versus the carbon dioxide released. So it's complicated, but you just need to know sort of how to define it in that sense there. Now, biodiesel versus petrodiesel. So this is the one that VCAR specifically wants you to be able to discuss. So we're gonna talk about a couple of aspects here. So the most important thing that I, th I think we should discuss here is sort of the shape. And yes, this is a little bit of organic chem, but organic chem is everywhere. As you can see here, they look identical other than this here. They have an ester bond. That is the only thing that changes them between the two. Biodiesel has an ester, petrodiesel does not. This means that this molecule here is therefore polar. It also means that this molecule here has a much sort of higher boiling point. Um, and it therefore has a higher liquid point or a higher solid point. Um, you've got to remember that this polar aspect changes everything. And this is where I said those intra versus intermolecular bonds, that's where this is really important. What is this going to have? It's going to have hydrogen bonds, dipole, dipole bonds. It's going to have all those things. Whereas petrodiesel, it's only really going to have dispersion forces. It's a non-polar molecule. Um, the other thing about petrodiesel is it produces lots of particulates and other toxins. This is sort of beyond the scope of VCAR, but essentially like petrodiesel sometimes has little extra bits here and there that are quite toxic. Um, it's just a part of what it is. Um, so therefore we say that it's quite dangerous. Now, we discussed some other things here. It says strong dipole dipole bonds making it more viscous. So what is viscous? Viscosity. Viscosity is a word that means Thickness. So I always think of viscosity as water versus honey. So you think about water versus honey, you put them both in a cup. If I pour water out of a cup, it's just going to pour. So it's going to get everything wet. I pour honey out of a cup, what's going to happen? It's probably going to take a good 20 seconds to actually leave the cup. It's going to be really cluggy and thick, and it's going to take a while to get out of there. That's the difference. I like to think of that as a difference of viscosity. This is um, less viscous, the water. It doesn't have a lot of viscosity because it's very fluid. It's very, it's a liquid, it moves very freely. The honey is extremely viscous. 
Why? Because it's thick, it's cluggy, it clogs things up. Um, and that's what we like to think with biodiesel versus petrodiesel. Biodiesel is more like the honey. It's thicker. It is more of like a big cluggy thing. Um, and it takes, it can sometimes when cooled down, block things up because it becomes so much like a jelly. Whereas petrodiesel, because of its non-polar and its weaker dispersion forces, is more like a fluid. It's like a water. It just flows. So if you think about using these in like, let's just say the Antarctic, you take a car to the Antarctic, a biodiesel is going to clog up those, the fuel lines because you're going to try and use it and it's just going to clog things up. Whereas petrodiesel, on the other hand, is not going to clog anything up because it's extremely like a liquid. So it's just going to flow. So that's one of the big things we like to talk about in terms of biodiesel versus petrodiesel. Now, the other thing here as well that I think is a really, really important slide here is how we compare. So Vikar loves to ask, let's compare. And it's actually one of the things that they're starting to phase out. So they're going to phase this out with the next study design. However, they say they're phasing it out every year and it's always every year in the exam. You can go back to last year's. I'm pretty sure there's a question asking this. Um, so how do we compare? So as you can see here, this is an example VCAR question. With reference to chemical structure, we've just somewhat, we've just sort of made it a little more summarized. This, but this was based off of VCAR question. With reference to chemical structure, compare the suitability of biodiesel and petrodiesel as fuels to power vehicles in cold environments. As you can see here, there's no comparison when we say petrodiesel only experiences weak dispersion forces, thus it has a lower cloud point, making it more suitable to use at low temperatures. Now, don't worry about cloud point, we'll discuss that in a little bit. Essentially, what we're saying here is there's no comparison there. As you can see there, it just says petrodiesel is, is weak, or petrodiesel is weaker, but it doesn't compare to what, it, what, what are we comparing it to. VCAR examiners, when they read a question, don't read, or when they read an answer, they don't read the question. They read your answer. They kind of want you to sort of explain what you're explaining. They want you to sort of say what the question was within your answer without saying, all right, the question was this and my answer is this. You don't want to say that. You want to give a bit of summary. So as you can see here, it says, while biodiesel experiences dipole-dipole attractions, petrodiesel only experiences weaker dispersion forces. Thus, petrodiesel has a lower cloud point than biodiesel, making it more suitable for fuels at low temperatures. This is telling me what the question was. The question was, what is, is, which is more suitable at low temperatures? That is what this last sentence is telling me. It's summarizing things. And what's really important is we mentioned both. We mentioned the biodiesel. We mentioned the petrodiesel. We mentioned the biodiesel again. We continue to mention these things. Like you need to mention both explicitly and talk about both explicitly when you do a comparison question. So this is a really important slide. I think if you take anything out of today, this